We are live. You want some music first uh, before we? <laughs> oh yeah, mate. Let's put some music on. It's good. Wait. Let's go. You must have pretty good internet. Me? Yeah. Actually, actually not, but uh. <laughs> This feels like the Eurovision Song Contest, mate. Yeah, <laughs> waiting for the song. <laughs> okay, so we're live on Facebook now. Yep, okay, Facebook is live. YouTube is live. I'm gonna share it. Hello, everyone. Let's get in there. Uh, Ah, that's always good. Uh. My internet isn't as good as we thought. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't consult us on the music here. No, yeah, no. It's uh, it's my playlist uh, from Belgium. <laughs> Straights, mate. Never goes amiss. Okay, good. I'm gonna check for, uh, and then we can start. Uh, everyone's joining in. Uh, let's go here. Let's see that we can get the questions. <clears throat> We're almost ready to go, guys. So thank you for joining in. Pleasure. Still need to find one more thing. Don't forget to press on, Christoph. <laughs> I think that's the thing. Okay, good. Um, good, we start in about two minutes, guys. Perfect. S sorry about uh, the music, it should have been better. Huh? <laughs> I'm not sure about Fletcher, I can't hear any music. <laughs> no, there's no music on, that's why. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just got to make your own music up. Yeah, I I'll, I'll can sing, but I don't know if that's what they want, so... Uh. You can sing. What would be your go-to song, Scotty? What would be your uh, karaoke? Oh, karaoke? Um... Italian or... So again, oh yeah, it, it would have to be something uh, by Pavarotti, obviously, um, <laughs> living near Modena. Um, Ness and Dorma, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can uh, can do that. Come on, Fletch, what would be yours? Uh, um, something from uh, the Toon Army in Newcastle. Elvis Presley, something in the ghettos, I like that. That's a good one. Uh, what else do I like? American Pie. We are in action. We are in action. Okay, um, I'm almost ready to see the questions, I think. And then we can go. Good. Okay, everyone, welcome on our live stream. Um, thank you for joining in. Uh, today we have John Fletcher and Nick Scott joining us. Um, first, I would like the guys to present themselves. So, Nick, can you present yourself uh, first? Who are you and what are you doing? 
Okay, so my name's Nick Scott. Um, I'm sitting in my house on the edge of Sherwood Forest in Nottinghamshire, um, but I would actually rather be uh, in my Italian home, Rugby Colorno, um, which is a city just on the edge of Parma where I'm director of rugby. Um, I've been director of rugby at Rugby Colorno now for uh, eight, about 18 months. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about the club. Um, as we go get further into the presentation. Before that, I was national coach development manager for the RFU. Um, started working in professional rugby in the year 2000 and um, became national coaching development manager in 2009 and uh, had a bit of a change of direction, looking for a bit of sunshine and a bit of a different experience. Uh, moved to Kalorno in September 2018. Fletch? Yes, Fletch. Uh, over to me is, I think you also forgot to mention that he's an expert on red fizzy wine. That's what I noticed when I was over there. He drinks huge well, amounts of copious Acquired expertise in the last 18 months. I, can I put that on my CV? You should do, purely for medicinal purposes, <laughs> I heard. Um, my name's John Fletcher, a.k.a. Fletch. Uh, um, from a rugby point of view, worked in Newcastle Falcons some time ago. That led into some opportunities with England rugby. So I was involved in their performance programme, probably best known for um, coaching their under 18s for uh, quite a few years, over 10 seasons. Um, and then the last couple of years, been involved with a, a good friend of mine, Russell Earnshaw, and the Magic Stig. Um, and one of the companies I'm involved in is the Magic Academy, where we're basically just trying to support coaches across the sport um, and a little bit of business. So we're venturing into the world of business, which is exciting. Okay. That's me. Really good. So thank you, guys. As I said already, thank you for coming. Uh, maybe something, what are we going to talk about tonight, John? Um, so we're going to talk about some practice design. So... These would be my principles. They're not necessarily principles of world rugby or the game. It's just stuff I think would be important to consider uh, when you're designing your practice. So that's what I'm going to get into. And Scotty is... I'm just going to look a little bit about how I've approached the role as a director of rugby and what I've learned uh, along the way, working in a different culture, um, really trying to um, concentrate and focus on the things that are important uh, and the things that are deliverable when you're working in, in a different culture, in a different environment. And also my job is, as director of rugby is across uh, the whole club. It's not just with, with one performance team. So how you can work on some principles to make sure that everybody points in the right direction. Okay, very good. Maybe for the viewers, how it's going to work tonight. So we are going to talk about some subjects, yeah, and it's want to make it as interactive as possible. So don't mind asking us questions through the show. We can just answer them. We'll stop the show, answer them, no problem at all. So just join in. So it's trying to be interactive in these times, social, on Skype, on other things. So it's good. Just ask your questions. So John, as I said, we're going to talk about the principles of a practice design. Yes, okay, so you can get deeper into that. Okay, well, if you just give it a big click. Um, so this is the stuff that I would be considering. Um, so mission, kind of like outcomes. Uh, skill games and then identify skills. Some countries would call that sort of game zone, skill zone, or a few. That's, that would be their language. But um, how comfortable are we coaching within the game? And then when do we need to jump out the game to, to sort of... Um, to focus and concentrate a little bit more on some skill development. Um, then around designing the practice, as always, we need to consider the individuals. Everybody is an individual. Uh, I want to focus around choice, support and stretch. So what are we doing around ensuring that people have opportunities to decide the direction of travel of the session? And as coaches, how are we supporting the people who are probably finding it tough and stretching the ones who are finding it a bit easier? Um, and then always it's a, we need to look at ourselves. How skillful are we as coaches? What, what skills are we working on as our coach in craft? Uh, um, and then towards the end, you know, what is feedback, reflection? And how are we linking it to the next time, the next time that we're together, however many days that is. In some environments, it'll actually be seven days. Other environments, it's two, two or three days' time. So 
So they would be my principles, and I'm just going to share some mainly pictures and just talk around the pictures, really. And as is, as Christoph's already said, please just chuck anything at. Um, I, I would love to hear some of your both your observations and uh, and stuff you're noticing from what I'm sharing, but also you know, share your wills. So uh, let's go. Should okay. I get in with Christoph? Yes, yes, yes. So we'll go to the next slide. We'll see what's our mission. Um, so mission is just basically around outcome. I think this is, and you'll probably see some, some of this language is from the gamification. So um, what sport can learn from the world of game? And so, you know, um, hundreds of thousands, my, my kids are, are gamers. They, they spend some time and would want to spend more time uh, on their gaming consoles. Uh, and there's reasons for, for that. They are unbelievably good performance and learning environments. So what can we as sport learn from that? And certainly one of the things is around their language. And it's definitely given me a bit of a, um, it's made me reflect on how I start the training session. Are the players aware of what we're trying to actually achieve in the training session? So here's just some examples. Uh, the mission on the right-hand side, as you're looking at the screen with the rugby ball next to it, is something that we did not that long ago. So just, um, yeah, we just laid out what the actual mission was. Often it's the same. So this is this was with an under. Um, I'm not sure which team this was because uh, I got three boys. I think it was the youngest one, so it'd be an under 12 team. So just a focus around everybody scoring. So that would be a big part of our mission. Um, more than seven ways to get the ball back. So we've got a big focus around the when we don't have the ball, um, and then an open question around beat the game. So beat the game tactically would be our language, or my, or my language, or the coach's language. Um, and then at the bottom, yeah, we just want players to try stuff. So to try a couple of things that they've never tried before in the game and just feel completely cool and relaxed about it. Some of it's going to go well, quite a bit of it's not going to go well. So that's around the mission. Uh, we would often share this with the opposition. So we would tell the opposition what our mission was. We'd definitely share it with the referee. I think it's important that the referee is part of part of the discussions. So we we would pull the ref over and we'd have some chats with the referee. We'd try and ask the referee some questions. Um, um, and we would check in at half time. Sometimes that would be with the opposition. Sometimes that would be with the referee as well. Okay. On the left hand side, we've got some secret missions. So the mission is for the whole team. Everybody would be aware of that. Uh, there's a secret mission on the top left, which is around stretch. So this is we did this for an under-15 player, actually, and I just um, walk into the training session. We're just given this secret mission. So he had some individual stuff that, in this case, he wasn't allowed to tell anybody. And then we would check in with it at the end of the training session. You know, here were the two or three players that had some secret missions. How did it go? What did people notice about it? So things such as um, this was around his defence, so six ways to get the ball back. He actually wasn't allowed to speak in defence. He's a real, he's quite a dominant character. So we just wanted to sort of take that away from the team to see who, yeah, just to see how they reacted. Um, he's also quite a dominant character around the huddles. Um, so he plays on the in, in the inside backs. He's he's often the guy that's leading the huddle. So we didn't want to take that away from him, but he just had to ask some questions. Um, and then yeah, I set him some challenges around challenging the coaches other than myself. Although he could challenge me, but I was actually aware of it. So he had to do a minimum of three times where he would actually challenge the coach a bit. And then there's a uh, we got a boy called Alfie who's just new, so we just wanted him to help Alfie score. Alfie doesn't score that many tries yet, and uh, we wanted to get uh, this player to support Alfie. Uh, and actually, Alfie scored two. So two tries in the training sessions, and this player was involved certainly in one of them. He had a big involvement in that. So secret missions is something to consider. The players really enjoy that language. Uh, they enjoy getting a see secret mission. Sometimes we do them in, in teams. So two, two or three people will have a secret mission. Okay. And then the one at the bottom is just one of our challenge cards. It's just around, look, we can do this stuff or we can continue to do it in games. It's just not about training. So training and games would, 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 uh, would be useful. And that's just one of our cards around the bench being the mission control and um, can you ask them to solve the problems that they're seeing? So actually, yeah, the the intent around the people, not on the pitch. 
so that's my bit around starting the sessions. Um, yeah, I've, I think it's had good. It's it's certainly had good outcomes. I think I think we're starting our sessions, starting our games, loads better than we used to. Okay, just uh, in terms of coaching, um, how do you manage? So we're talking about the mission the whole time. The mission is, of course, the purpose. You give a lot of autonomy to the players. So how, as a coach, do you react in those missions? Do you let them a lot of creativity and freedom in searching on how to beat the game? Or how do you react as a coach on coaching that way? Yeah, I, I mean, you go with it. Um, all of these came from the players, actually. So the right-hand side didn't come from us. We just sort of... Um, everybody in the team score would be one that we'd be working on all season, actually. You know, that, that would be a big focus for, for ours is just to try and find different ways of scoring, give people opportunities to score. Um, so the players actually came up with, with them all. Um, in terms of our, my, our skills as a coaching team, yeah, we've got to be prepared to, to go with the game or go with the training session. Um, so we, yeah, you've just got to be skillful and, 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 and comfortable. And, it, and at times it can, you know, you might people might consider it as a bit, chaotic or it's it's a moving feast it looks a bit messy sometimes but um often the players are having a great time they're working it out themselves um yeah it's a good challenge for, for a coach okay i have a question here from riff uh what mission would you use to get your team communicating if they don't communicate at all how would you challenge that your challenge your players in that uh, mission uh, well, our, our language around that would be coach the ball player. So that's the language that that we would use. We'd be pretty consistent around, um, you know, our, do do we have people who are coaching each other? So we deliberately use that language. Um, sorry, just, sorry, Fletch, that would be the, the support players c coaching the ball player, you mean by yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. so we're, it would be players around the person with the ball or around the person who's about to have some form of impact if it's from a defence. So how are we coaching each other would be our language. We tend not to use the word communication. If I'm honest, it's it's it would just be around, it would, it would just be around coaching each other. Um, would be the language, and we we'd have some strategies such as um, only certain members of the team would be allowed to speak. Um, you can do that as in, you can share that responsibility. So Christoph say you're really good at communicating, and I'm not so strong. Maybe we could pair up, and for the next bit of the play, there's only us two allowed to speak. Um, we could we could model some good practice so the, those players who are really strong at it, let them do it and then and let some others have some opportunities. We can actually exaggerate the problem, which would be probably one of the first things I would go to. So I'd probably prevent them from speaking. So actually they've got to pay, play a period of, try, of the game or, or the training session where they're not allowed to speak. Oh. Um, often they'll find that difficult and often they'll see the benefit of actually coaching each other. Um, and often you'll get a spike afterwards. So when you've prevented it, you've, so you've exaggerated the problem, it's a problem, let's make the problem a bigger problem. Then um, often the players have this, these moments around, uh, actually, yeah, this is, this is not that helpful. Um, okay. Clearly things around praise. So when you've seen it done well, just, you know, praise people. Okay, what's, good. What, what's anybody else? Christoph, how, how would you do it? Um, I, I think communication is like you say, it's a lot about what word you use. What is communication? It's, it's, it's not like the word communication. It's always easy as a coach to say you have to communicate better. But what do you mean with that? So I think if you formulate your mission, it's about what language do we use on the pitch and how do we help each other in that language? So it's more like a rugby language that we need to promote to our players instead of everyone shouting. What? We also notice is that sometimes it gives you more focus with less talking. So it, it lets them see that it's more like efficient communication. It's not about everyone communicating. So, uh, yeah, that helped our teams a lot already. So that's good. I think one thing that's really important about communication is having the same language. Um, and that language, as you just said, the word being efficient. If you look at a rally driver and the co-driver, um, everything is happening so quickly. There's not a wasted word. They've got a common language. It's almost like a code. And, and I think that's really important in rugby players because things are happening at such speed, such pace. Um, 
they've got almost this secret language or this secret code where they every word is understood and every word is meaningful and nothing is wasted. Um, one of my really um, bugbears is, you might call it over-communication, but meaningless communication. Um, people just making a noise for the sake of it. Um, there tends to be an over-reliance as well on verbal communication rather than uh, just looking at body language and shape and what's happening in front of you as well. So communication isn't just isn't just verbal communication. It's all sorts of communication being signals being sent and, and received. Okay, I have a I have a question from Matthias Matthias Hundu. Um, so we were talking about the missions. At what age would you start that? So would you do it for an under twelve already, or is it something yeah, that we can? From, yeah, I would do it from when they start playing. Five, sixes, sevens, depend on your country. I think they're really comfortable with the language. They understand it. Um, clearly, what the content and the information and would you know that would be based upon the context and and the age and the experience of the players. But yeah, I would start it right from the beginning. I'd go. I'd actually do it into seniors if I'm honest. Far too often the seniors don't know what the hell's going on in training. They don't really understand where it where it actually connects to the game they've just had. Um, so yeah, I would do it all all the way through. I wouldn't necessarily do it every single training session or every game, but I would do it for quite a lot. Okay, good. Okay, we can go on with the next slide. Um, keep giving those questions, guys. Very good, good questions. So we're talking about skill games and skill training. Yeah, so I think more most people now are pretty comfortable and and pretty. Um, efficient and effective around and understanding the importance of skill games so um, in my opinion my experience the start of a training session should be with a game some form of skill game and um, we actually came up with um, eight skill games we've actually added one more in so a number of skill games and um, that cover uh, pr pretty much most of the skills all of the skills that you would want to practice the beauty of a skill game is you is you're just focusing on, you know, a relatively small number of skills. So it affords you an opportunity just to spend more time on the skills that um, that the game is going to afford you. Um, and then clearly from the game, it's identifying what are the skills either as individually or, or or a group or actually a team or everybody would benefit from going to spend some more time on around some skill training, some skill zone work. Um, my opinion, my experience is that is far too many people plan that and they're missing some opportunities. So you might have a, a mind on, look, it's probably going to be this, it might be this, this is what I've seen in the past. But I'd be relatively open-minded. Uh, I think we're assuming just because they they did it last training session or they played in a certain way maybe in the game that then actually they might have you know, they might have had some conversations with them. They might have done some stuff to actually fix some of the things that, that you've seen. So I'd be open-minded to what the skill session is going to be. In my opinion, I wouldn't jump out of games more than twice. Um, sometimes you don't need to come out of it at all. But I think twice is a number that is a reasonably comfortable number around. Actually, we're going to jump out and we're going to do some stuff. Um, I think that's a good use of core coaches. So. I work with a number of coaches across the number of age groups that I'm helping coaching with. And we would always have conversations about who's actually going to be taking some people out to do certain things. Um, I'd, I'd be wanting different ways of doing it. So can the players a volunteer? So actually ask them if they won't, won't want to do it. Um, you might want to... Um, bribe's not the right word, but you, you, you definitely want to encourage some players to go into do some more skill work because the game possibly isn't giving them enough opportunities to get better at stuff. And that's basically what skill training affords you is a, you're just going to get more re repetition. Yeah. Um, so there are skill games as you're looking at the screen in the top left. The bottom left is, is the gamification stuff that the Magic Academy's produced. So we've gamified the skill games at the top. We've actually gamified them. Um, the top right is just an idea around so we're playing a game, I think in the game we were playing, I think we were playing Saracens, and then in addition to that, people scored points for doing certain skills within the game. So that's called skill bingo. So they're playing 
they're playing a game, it's a skill game. And then in addition to that, as coaches or as a group, we 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 feel as though these are the skills that we want to try and bring out of this game. And and they score points around it. And we basically made it into bingo. Okay. Um, and then the bottom right is this is from a guy called Jack Patterson from London Irish. He's a he's a fellow wizard, and he's just sort of identified the different types of training environments that coaches need to be comfortable in. We would all have biases towards I like small sided games. That's when I feel as though I'm at my best as a coach. I prefer them as a player. Um, um, my 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 bias would be toward to would be to win or be in small sided games a lot. However, I need to be comfortable in the other areas of coaching as well. So the 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 gamification, the, the tactical stuff, the drilly stuff, um, the free play. You know, we we need to create these environments so people can get better. So yeah. they're my views around skill training. I think. I think we're smashing the skill games. I think what I've seen across across rugby is that we more games are being played. I think coaches are becoming more skillful in the games, although I still think some have got some way to do. I think we're not transitioning out into skill training that well, and far too often, in my opinion, the skill training is not that effective. It's not it's not fit for purpose. It's not it's just not helpful. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're putting enough attention into our skill training and our skill zone work. Um, some people might refer to that as technical. Um, so we're taking even more things away and focusing on less. Um, you know, how can we be more creative around that environment and get it back into the game and ensure that what they've been practicing, we start to notice a bit. Yeah. In the game, so so I think the the hard part there is is like uh, we already discussed this to keep that purpose inside your uh, inside your skill games. Um, as a coach, I think you need to really know what you want to see and what you want to observe and analyze during those skill games. Uh, so, like John said, it's really important that we try to get it on the pitch what we do in our skill training. So. That's the important part. Keep your pur purpose with those games. Those games have those purposes, but we need to, as a coach, still need to see what we want to see. So that's the important part there. Um, I have a one more question about communication, if, if, if we have there. So maybe last one about communication. So um, it's a bit of the same uh, with Murphy's and uh, Sam Vance asking the same about, now, what language do you ask your coaches to teach? Is it something related to the club? Um, that goes from top to from bottom to top. So when they go to the next year, that they can communicate in the same language. And so you need to train your coaches also in the same language. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And Scotty made a great point earlier, and and I, I would agree. Far too often, the players and fellow coaches and parents and sometimes your core coaches don't really know what you're talking about. Um, and you're often saying the same things. You're just saying it in different way. You. The, the club would benefit, the whole club would benefit from agreed language. What do certain things mean? Um, so some broader things around, you know, what it, what is technique? What is skill? What do we mean by by support? Um, and just agree what language we're going to use and what the definition is. I yeah. don't think uh, it would be a good use of time. It wouldn't take that long. We actually did it as an exercise and it was, yeah, I, I felt it was really important. Um, and, and then we'd keep on checking in with each other so if we heard somebody so for instance if somebody's using the words like that's a good line of running to us it's we would just use support you know we wouldn't use that language we would just reference that as support and support would fit into our principles of play um, but I think every, every, so a good line is something it's jargon um, it's jargon that coaches often use with younger players they have a different um, interpretation of what that means uh, to what the player's got. Um, and it just becomes meaningless buzzwords uh, if we're not careful with different, uh, uh, with different interpretations. So avoidance of jargon, I think, is really, really important. The stuff we hear on the TV from commentators, I won't name any of them. Okay. Good. Um, just, so, so just uh, just on that language, because I do think it's important. One, so, so my boy was playing football 
soccer in some people's worlds. And the coach kept on shouting, shape, get in your shape, watch your shape. And he used the word a lot. So um, at, at the end of the game, I, I just went in to check in with the coach. He's a good guy. And I said, so what do you mean by shape? And he told me what he meant by shape. I then went and asked his son. I said, what, what do you think your dad means by shape? I asked my son and I asked two, two other players. And, the, and they weren't that aligned on what it meant. So he actually had this word. I actually... I agree with Scotty. That shape to me is is not a particularly useful word, but even and he used it a lot. Um, and his son, the coach, my son, and two of our players were not that aligned on what it meant. Um, so yeah, it wasn't very effective communication. Okay, good. So we're going on with coach the individual. So an important yeah, part. I, I, I mean, I think this is absolutely key. Um, I'm going to tell a, a, a quick story. So I went to watch a session in Scotland. It was an outstanding session, really strong. Uh, five coaches, uh, first team, second team, and some thirds. So it was a senior session, real good flow. Uh, they had some conversations inside. It really flowed well. Um, made absolute sense to me what was going on. But I probably noticed that there wasn't a huge amount of individual support. So as the players came off, and I didn't do it with everybody, but I kind of asked quite, quite a few how many felt as though you'd been individually coached? So the coach actually had a conversation that you felt was useful for you as an individual. Um, and not, not many said yes. So the vast majority of players said, no, I don't feel as though I've had individual support, even though they'd been part of a, a very, very effective training session. Um, and so it's a nudge to us all, really, is that we've got we to gotta coach the individuals. We've got to, you know... I mean, within that, we've got to understand them. So we've got to take time. And uh, to me, it's, and I keep, um, so when I'm in my clubhouse, people will be talking. And um, um, I, I, I like to talk about the person, not and not the player. So uh, eventually we'll talk about the player. Of course we will. But every start of every conversation that, that we had, I want them to refer to the person because, you know, they're people and it's a person before the you know, this this person is a player. So think about the person and the player. I think that, that is useful. Uh, everybody's an individual. Um, everybody sees the world through their eyes. Everybody will be different. There, there'll, there'll be some stuff that's similar, um, but very rarely will it be the same. And often it'll be very, very different. Yeah. So I've just I've just got a few examples. So we start top left. So the big guy with the red hat, that's a guy called James Scott, second row. Um had some stuff going on in his life. He's he's sort of mum was terminally ill, she's absolutely uh, she's subsequently died. Um very different to myself, very different to the other coaches who I worked with at the time. He actually made a decision that he wanted to be in our environment because it was an environment where he felt as though he was he was well supported, he was well challenged, but he felt as though it was a really good environment for him at that time. Um, but we challenged him very differently to the guy below. So the guy below with the headband on is actually Marcus Smith, an inside back from England. And he would be the most skillful games player I have ever coached. And I've coached him pretty skillful players. I've been quite fortunate. Uh, and they would be very, very different. So how we supported them and challenged them would be really, really different. The other extreme so the little girl um, from uh, Malaysia, we went into school, we did some stuff she hadn't played that much rugby, she was from netball, she wasn't really having a particularly positive experience we give her some superpowers um, and it completely changed our world um, So because we started to support the individual and in that case, as a, as a skill we, we just afforded her to come up with our team to come up with some superpowers that that would make this a, a much more positive experience, and she and she came up with some awesome stuff, and it just it just changed her experience. Um, and I believe she now continues to play. She plays netball and rugby. She plays for the the school uh, the school touch team. Um, the guy with the target top on that's Foxy. So this is quite an extreme measure. Often with our talented players or players who would need some feedback, we'd put on the target T-shirt, and the target could mean quite a lot of things. So People, he's just come off. People were actually trying to rip the shirt off him. Every time they got a shot on him, then these they, the team got quite quite a lot of points. If they forced him into an error, they got quite a lot of points. So he had quite a tough day. 
Um, we really wanted a stretchy skill. And, and to be honest, it wasn't just his rugby skill. It was more around his behaviour. So he would often be arguing with the referee. He'd be often, you know, let's call it losing his head. He would certainly lose focus. Um, and we were trying to support him, not only in, the, in his rugby stuff, we're trying to support him around his behaviour and his, his ability to control himself in situations uh, that are going to happen on, on the pitch. And then the last picture, uh, they're, they're looking pretty grumpy, actually, but that's my oldest and my, and my youngest. Um, so they're just having a game of ping pong, and it's just around support and stretch. So when they play against each other, um, the uh, the little fella would need some support, and the older one would need some stretch. However, when they're in their own environment, so uh, the young lad Ted would be would be reasonably skillful across his own age group, across a number of sports. So he would then uh, I would have a different approach. He would need to be he would need to be stretched a bit. And Ollie, the oldest one, again, he he would train up a bit. Uh, this year, as a 16 year old went in the Colts, would need a little bit more support around that. So it changes all the time. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned is just around choice. Um, I think we need to keep on checking in with them, make sure they're all right. As in, could we do anything different? Um, things such as always, are we happy with this side of the pitch? Do we want to start with this? Do you want to play with a different ball? So asking some questions around, keep on checking in with them as individuals and as a team, um, and around giving them a choice. And choice isn't you can do whatever you want. You can give them a choice of A and B, or you can give them a choice. You can do whatever you want. But so certainly be smart around the choice. Um, Rusty tells a great one, which some of you might have heard. Look, as he says to his daughter, "Do you want to go to bed now, or do you want to go to bed in ten minutes?" She says, I want to go to bed in 10 minutes. So he's given her the choice. She's got some autonomy. And he wanted to go to bed in 10 minutes anyway. Um, so, yeah, that's that's some, just some stuff around individuals. I, I think you touched two, two nice things there, John. Um, the first one, Nick can probably also like like uh, touch a lot on that. It's like we have to coach behaviors a lot more. So d definitely in the modern era where we actually teach attitudes and it's become more important in teaching them how to be creative, how to be problem-solving, and how to be self-reflective. Um, going to different countries, like Nick now is in Italy, it changes a lot, and I think, Nick, you can talk a bit further on that also now, on what does it change for you in coaching behaviors and different cultures and stuff? Has it been a big part of you in coaching attitudes? or um, The... the... So I was going to talk about this a little bit in my uh, a little bit later on, but it's a really good time to come into it. Coaching the individual um, is really important, um, but it's important not to put people in boxes. So somebody you may consider somebody to be um, aggressive or a leader or have a certain attribute and think they're going to be like that all the time. Um, one of the things we ask our coaches to do in Kawano is to uh, just mingle with the players for 10 minutes before a session, find out if it's the, the, the younger ones, who's had a good day at school, who's had a bad day, who's in a good place, who's in a, in a bad place, because people are not, are not consistently in the same emotional state. So moving that on to um, the uh, uh, working with the performance team in Kawana, we've got guys of Filipino heritage, Romanian, Fijian, Samoan, South African, uh, we've got, uh, and within Italy, we've got Sardinians, Sicilians. It would be very easy and probably mentally lazy just to put them into a certain place and treat them in a certain way because of where they come from, because of the perceived cultural idea that you have of them. Actually, the way to be as a coach is, is treat them much more individually and look not just how they're feeling, how, how they generally tend to react, but how are they feeling at this, this point in time? Are they ready to work? Are they less ready to work? Do they need to talk? Um, just having a little bit of emotional intelligence is, is much more important. It's quite difficult working with different cultures. Um, no, it's not difficult. It's, it's, it is challenging working with different cultures because some of the signals... <clears throat> may not be the ones that you are used to picking up. Um, they may be different 
non-verbal non signals from people and there's a risk that you misinterpret those um, so all of your emotional intelligence has to get turned up the dial goes up to 11 um, there can be lots and lots of things that are unsaid but just with a bit of um, yeah a bit of um, just looking through a slightly different lens um, you can uh, be much more insightful in, in your interventions and how you use people. Yeah, okay. Uh, then the second part you touched on, which was really interesting, and maybe it's now more on the how coaching, is the individual feedback. And I think with the individual feedback, it's more like you dare to move around. Uh, like some coaches are don't don't like to let go of their structure. So they just stay to stay there to keep the structure and the, the organization flowing. So that means they don't have the time to actually talk to individual players. So what do you think on moving around and positioning yourself in purpose of individual feedback and in purpose of your purpose, uh, John? Hello? John? Oh, Fletch. You're muted. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I just put you on mute. It's slightly <laughs> was uh, <talking laughs> No uh, problem. Um, yeah, look, I, I think it's a great point. Uh, clearly, you're going to see the game differently from different places for those who have, um, yeah, I mean, for, you know, for those who have been coaching for a while, then you will clearly have an awareness that, depending on where you stand, is to depend on what information you're going to get. So try and get as much information as you can. Information, information, i.e., awareness is going to help is going to help support your decision making as a coach. So. So definitely look to move around. Uh, just on feedback, and I'm going to talk a little bit later on, but I think what we also need to consider is to support the players in, because feedback needs to start with self. So actually, how how are they giving themselves some feedback? You know, How skillful are they around them processing information themselves? Uh, very often you see, so especially you younger players, often they'll look for, you know, they'll look to the coach or they look to parents or they'll look to to somewhere else to get some information. Uh, I don't think that's helpful. Um, I think um, feedback needs to start with self. So how are you able to self-analyze? Um, and there's some skills you can do with that. Then peer-to-peer, -peer, I think is really powerful. To me, it's the most powerful feedback. Yeah. So actually, can you get the players, can you create an environment where players are, are supporting each other around feedback? Uh, and again, there's lots of strategies around that, just simple as pairing, pairing people up. Okay. Put them in little groups, um, getting people to come out of the games or come out of the training, and get them to feedback on what they're seeing of some of some of their teammates. And then clearly, the coach is going to be part of that feedback process as well. But in my opinion, it should be pretty much last. Um, I think some stuff to watch out for, for for a coach is far too often we give feedback and then we don't follow it up. So we'll say something or um, here's a challenge or. Um, um, uh, they'll give some feedback on something that they've seen and then they they don't support that player for the next period of time they move on to the next thing um, and I just think they're missing some opportunities ar around that okay. um, how, how do you trigger self-feedback uh, Fletch is it uh, because one thing I think is underused is, is uh, co-coaches involved in the session just to trigger uh, self-feedback yeah, look, it, 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 it'd be based upon sort of, sort of, sort of what and sort of how. So you know, so what you know, what's going well, and um, and you know, and sort of how can it be better? It's it's those sort of it's those sort of questions. So when they do something positive, actually, do they understand why has it gone well? So say I put you through a gap. So do I understand why? How have I got a real? You know, so what have I just done then? Why has that worked well? So. Um, so get them just to reflect in the moment. You know, I've just done a cross-field kick. I've just made a great tackle. I've turned the ball over. Can I process, um, as in, what have I done and why has it gone well? And then when it hasn't gone well, like, how, how could it be better the next time? So say I've just missed the same tackle or I've dropped the ball on my foot. I've gone for a cross-field and I haven't quite got the trajectory or haven't got it. Do I understand how it could be better the next time? So if we just get players, and you're absolutely right, I think core coaches can help, can just ask those questions. But if it's too much coming from the coach, the players will just, 
you know, they'll just rely or just wait for the coach just to be doing their self process. So, yeah, I think things I would do, I would clearly get co coaching drug supported, ex- you know, explain it to the players a bit. Um, after they've done something really good, get them to go and write it somewhere. So, you know, so I've just made, made a line break, and this is why I think I've made the line break. And then, and then the coach can go and check in, and if, if, if everybody's absolutely fine, you can just continue to play the game. And that would be the same as how is it going to be better next time. So say, I, say I've gone for a tackle off my right shoulder and, and I've got my head in the wrong place. No. Okay. And, and, oh, so, oh, and, and, and again, I can just go and write that down. There doesn't always need to be verbal communication. There doesn't always need to be a question for, from the coach. Okay. So that's the stuff I'd be thinking, Christopher. But, uh, Christoph, but far too often, the players aren't... The players are missing opportunities to get better because they don't process feedback well in. Okay, good. I have two questions here. Um, the first one is from Murphy Slommel. So, on the individual coaching, how do you support individuals on training who don't like getting into contact? Mostly they get on the bench instead of playing. How can you give them a choice into this? Um, well, they'd probably need more benefit a little bit around from the around the skill game so they'd probably benefit from going to a bit more repetition around some skills could you give them some superpower could the game look different so could you always start the game with them pretty close to the opposition so me and Scotty would get really close I'd pass the ball to either me or Scotty so I have an opportunity to run and be pretty effective around that part of the collision or actually give it a give it to Scotty and I've got a better chance of better chance of tackling them um Sometimes you're not always able to do this. I think we're very good at moving players up and giving them that stretch. I think we need to consider moving players down okay. and just giving them an opportunity to have more success. I think we're very reluctant. It's part of the general culture, so certainly in England. I think players, I think schools do it a lot better than clubs. There's some regulations that is not that helpful, in my opinion. Um, but I do think we need to consider just giving players different environments. Uh, and and uh, it, it clearly in, a good environment would be to give somebody where they're going to have some more success, where they're going to find it easier, quite frankly. It's just too hard. At that moment in time, it's too hard. And no, part of that would be confidence. Some of it will be their actual skill levels, might be experience. So it would be a combination of that. Um, clearly look to reward it when it goes well, it's more likely to happen again. Be patient. Um, okay. yeah, it's, it's the I, and, and, and some stuff generally. I do think the game, and I'm actually I'm actually working on this as we speak, which I'm happy to share because I'm 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 being really intentional about it based upon my experiences of my club, a club in the northeast of England, um, where I don't think we as a club are doing enough to support the kids who are not confident in the collision. Um, so things that we're thinking about, we need a band touch or the word touch. I don't think it's helpful. So we now call it shoulders. So nowhere in our uh, in in our club do we call it touch, and we don't play touch with hands. We play touch with shoulders. And um, so we just try and get and we've and we've adapted some of our games. So some of the games we take some pace off. We close down the space. People just have more and more opportunity to get into a. Bit Position where they're close to, to the opposition without the force and the pace. Um, so this, touch, this touch with only shoulders, Fletch, is this your influence in some of the England t- uh, tackles that we're putting in Six Nations? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the game's actually called shoulder wrap, so that's what we call our game. Okay. Shoulder wrap. That's fine. Uh, just checking. Yeah, it's just checking. Just, in, just, in the yeah, England I, team, they just don't wrap. Huh? I, think, I think, and rightly so, the game is coming from it from a safety point of view, and I get that, and that is the most important. But I actually also need to think we need to be really intentional around supporting the skill development of the kids and telling them to tackle low and doing often the, the pointless drills that I'm seeing people doing, and it's not helpful. It's not helpful. Oh. There needs to be a bit more push-pull. Uh, we, we just need to be more creative in, in coaching defence than... Uh, as creative as co- in coaching defence as what we are in coaching attack. Okay, good. So we're very creative in coaching attack. 
and not so much in defense. That's good, good. So we go to the next question. Um, we have no problem. It's all interesting, so keep on going. Um, we have from Flores. So when do you choose to change the position of a player that he really wants to play, but it clearly isn't made for him? So moving him from backs to forwards or vice versa, or is there... Uh, no, well, I have some reasonably strong views on this that not everybody who listen to this might uh, like, if I'm honest. So my views, and I'm just going to share them. So my point of view on positional stuff is I think all kids should play all positions till they're about 13, 14, so just at the start of maturation. Then I would narrow the game into four positions. Uh, front row, back five of the scrum, inside and outside backs. Outside backs would be 13, 14, 15, 11, 15. So from about 13, 14, they would start to migrate into one of those four positions. But let's just say the player is a back five player of the scrum. He would play across left lock, right lock, open side, blind side, number eight. He can continue to rotate around there mainly. There's no reason why he couldn't play in other positions, but he's probably... And then by the time they're about 70 and 80, and I think they're probably going to find... You know, so if it is a back five that's going, actually, I'm probably going to play right hand lock and I'm going to play most of my rugby at right hand lock. I think we push them into positions four too, too quick, quickly. Don't think it's helpful. The governing bodies don't want it. So the vast majority of, of governing bodies now would, would be delaying the positional stuff, but still the clubs are ignoring it. I referee the game under 12s. It's meant to be the first five into a scrum. Um, sorry, the first three into a scrum, there is no pushing. You are allowed a competitive hook. And the team we were playing against had players playing in position at 11 years of age. And it was just nonsense, really. Um, and I don't think it's helpful, <laughs> both in terms of retention of players. So I actually think we lose players because of it. And I don't think they're as skillful as what they could be. Um, now, I do get... And we've got a boy called Benji. So Benji's a rock star. Benji's probably going to end up in the front row. Um, he's he is well, he's he's now 15. So um, I'll be honest. He's he played all the multiple positions. He's predominantly for the last two years played across the front row. He'd be skillful at left at left prop, right prop, and and hooker. And he's probably so. When I spoke to him last, he said, "Look, I'm I I actually want to play tight head." And that's that's the position out of all of the three I've tried that I want to I want to play more of if I can. So that's my positions on that. Okay, good. I have uh, one more question, which is uh, from Jonathan Flynn, our uh, Luxembourg friend. If peer-to-peer -peer feedback is best, and we have, as you say, some great seen some great sessions with almost no coaching the individual, then how important is it that we actively intervene as coaches? Yeah, I just think you've got to wait for coaching moments. So um, I'm always thinking, and I'm, when I'm watching and supporting coaches, I want to coach myself, is I'm always asking myself the same question. Am I getting in the way? If I wasn't here, would they be doing some better stuff? Um, and I think it's a question we should continue to ask ourselves. So, yes, I passionately believe that good coaching and good coaching coach and coaching groups and can really add to an environment um, and support individuals and teams but often we are overdoing it, we're over coaching um, so I think it's a great point um, I would just wait for a certain number of moments and then probably use the rest of the time just to keep on checking in with people to be honest and the more we speak the less they're going to speak the more we do or we set the game or we set the rules, the less that they're going, going, going to do. Um, and they would get on absolutely fine if we weren't there. It's proven in other countries. So the countries that I've visited across a number of sports, the, probably the ones with the least sophistic, sophisticated coaching environments or coaching structures are often the ones that produce the best teams, the best players. You can look at India and cricket, Brazil in the old days of football, New Zealand and rugby. So New Zealand, until quite recently, really, their coaching, they always had very strong coaching, but their coaching systems weren't that strong, really. Okay. Scott, well, what's your view on that as head of coach development for the RFU? I, I've got exactly the same um, observation as you. Where do the best soccer uh, players come from? Uh, it's Brazil. Um, 
or Africa where they play the least structured, have the least structured um, coaching environment. It's not just coaching though, Fletch, it's around, a lot of it is around competition and the competition with framework and expectations and stuff like that that we put around kids um, takes away because we don't want to lose this cup game. We don't want to lose this important game. We, you know, it, it, it's all um, uh, encouraging people, coaches and, and ultimately players to play with fear rather than freedom. Okay. Yeah, great. Great. It's a great point. Good. We'll go on to the next slide. So we're talking about the coaching craft. Yeah, so look, I mean, um, yeah, so I think I think these are the foundations of coaching. So um, if it was a house, our coaching craft house would be built around these. So your ability to observe, it was mentioned before. So um, the best coaches that I've that I've noticed or I've been around would have would be really strong around their observational skills. So they're not assuming anything. Um, yeah, they would. I, they just take in information everywhere. They're always looking. So you know the best coaches off the pitch in the changing room in the dining room, in the clubhouse, they're just taking in information. They just never stop just looking for stuff. And then it's around noticing. So noticing, in order to notice something, you've got to kind of know what you're trying to look for. So what is the stuff that you're looking for? So a classic when you, let's take it, it's a, it's a, you know, it's an age group team. So where do people automatically go and put themselves? Do they put themselves out wide? Um, do they put themselves a first receiver? Um, what do they do when they first receive the ball? Are they comfortable off left hand, right hand? So what stuff are you looking for? What's the stuff that you that you're that you're noticing? Um, and again, the best coaches. So Eddie Jones, who's a really strong grass coach, is outstanding at just taking in information, and his noticing skills are sensational. So he is very very strong at just noticing stuff so I, often I'm in a better position watching the training session and I'm and I'm missing some stuff and he like he'll have a conversation or he'll change a rule or he'll or he'll just check in with, with a player or he'll or he'll get a player to talk to another player he's very good at noticing stuff and then he's very skillful around how how to make the best um, using his skills as a coach attending was just coaching it's the skills we're going to talk about and responding and again, I think Eddie's very strong at it. Um, you know, when you say uh, when you watch somebody like an Eddie coach, and you go, right, what was best four or five moments in the training session? They'd be very strong. It would be something that's happened. He's linked the game, or he's linked the skill training, or he's linked the conversation he had in the meeting. He's he's, he's weighted, so he doesn't do a lot of intervention. Doesn't do a lot of sort of commentating or chatting. He'll just wait for those moments. And if you often analyse his best three or four coaching moments, his responding moments, they're really strong. Um, and I wish I was as good. And these would just be some major... So, yeah, send them. so they're just some other skills that you would want. I mean, what what, what are people interested in? I'm, I don't want to talk through them all. What, what are people curious about? Which one do you want to know more about? There's probably one that I want to share with. It, it doesn't come up, but... Um, just just on the responding part, uh, I think as a coach you can you can like prepare that. As a coach, you you know what probably is gonna go wrong, or maybe what's gonna go good. So you can set yourself beforehand on the observation, on the noticing, and you can get quick response, as John said, just by knowing your scenarios, what can happen before you give the practice already. So that can help yourself to get to quick responding and observing and noticing. Yeah, and again, I, I would practice it. I mean, you've obviously practiced everything, coach, but I would do things like visualize it. You're absolutely right, Christoph. You know, so how much are we visualizing or thinking about some situation scenarios that are possibly going to happen so we can respond really effectively, really quick? Um, yeah, so you know, it can just have maximum impact. It okay. can have good transfer. Okay, I have a question from uh, Cedric Alonso. Um, he asks if you can elaborate on the challenges with the cards. Okay, so challenges is just around 
just um, well, we've actually developed some some player coach and other challenge cards. So it's just around either the players setting them all, you know, the the players set their own challenges, or you as a coaching group, or players set challenges for for each other. Um, I'd base the vast majority of the challenges around their strengths. So what stuff are they really good at? Let's set some exciting challenges around that. But also some, you know, maybe um, maybe some stuff that that they want to get better at. So it's just around setting a challenge. So an example, a challenge to that my son, my middle boy, would often set himself was, um, Dad, I, I want you to keep score on how many different ways I can get the ball back in this game. My youngest one once said to me, Dad, I want you to see, I want to set myself a challenge to see how many players I can make fall over without touching them. So I'm going to dance around. I want to see if I can make people fall over. So that it's just, yeah, it's just some challenges in the game. And it's a great way to, to use parents and co-coaches. So the clickers, I think everybody in everybody in Europe must have some clickers. Just the clickers that you can, so you can measure some stuff, uh, sell some challenges. And I would look to keep the, I would love to keep the score. I would love to keep them some information. So I can give them some feedback. Okay. Nick, I have a question for you. Um, like everything we talk about in the game sense training and everything around it, um, the way of coaching, um, you have came from the RFU where they actually made the whole system around the card system. Um, how was it for you in Italy to implement a way of autonomical, uh, autonomical coaching and with the challenges and with everything in your club? So here we do we do talk a little bit about um, the cultural differences. The um, the word for expert in Italy is maestro, and the expectation of parents, uh, the expectations of people who who employ coaches, is that the coach should be the maestro, the person who uh, directs, the person who who has all the solutions, and um, he's the master, and everybody else is the apprentice. So culturally, that's quite a big hurdle to get across when you hear a coach asking questions, um, when you hear a coach um, almost showing vulnerability and uh, not being the, the director. So actually, how is it perceived? Um, I think there was a, um, uh, and also, sorry, I should say, the Italian education system is still pretty much along that that root um how kids learn at school is still pretty much upon that master and apprentice um so i think when i arrived there was a perception that actually yes this was the way to go uh, it was welcomed um with interest it was welcomed with enthusiasm um in a lot of ways and for a lot of coaches and i can think of three or four in particular it was actually um <clears throat> they were grateful that they had permission to coach in a different way. Um, and they've taken it uh, in um, with Italian players. They've taken it further than I could ever take it. Um, they understand how to deliver this in a way that is um, is interesting over there. So, uh, yeah, it, it was... Um, we are perceived as, uh, in our warm-ups and things like that, we are perceived as quite a, a strange club, the way we, we do stuff. Um, we do do things in a different way. Um, time will tell. Uh, we will... Uh, but, there ha but no, Sorry, time will tell, but there has been a, a genuine acceptance and a welcoming of the approach in Kelowna. Okay, I, I actually think, and it's, it's a quite nice discussion in what we are doing, it's uh, if you look at the modern way of coaching, and also it's also not coaching only in sport events and, and, and stuff like that, it's changing, because I think in the old days we had our book, the one who read the book, made exams for it, he had the knowledge, and he was telling the others what he read in the book where we, like you say now, we can go from a much wider interest and also we need to manage that whole other system differently in how to coach Actually, and in that. So. I think a step change in there was coaching through principles rather than uh, coaching passing, coaching tackling, coaching, you know, the, the kind of the skills that, w that w uh, we used to coach. Uh just coaching people and commenting or feeding back on how we went forward. 
our decision making around continuity, our decision making around where, how, and where we went forward. That's quite that's quite liberating, actually. You 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 don't have to um, uh, feed back on all the technical stuff and get lost in that technical stuff. As long as we go forward, or as long as we we achieve the principles of play, um, then that changes the nature of our feedback. That changes uh, how we feedback. Yeah, I think we, we, need, we need to co- we. We need our feedback needs to focus, and I found this is this is coming in Colorno. It needs not to be solely focused on on the execution, but the decision as well. Um, too often we just, you know, it's a great decision. You see, make somebody you know use space really well. Uh, maybe the execution at the end of that decision isn't fantastic. The coaches generally only feed back on that execution at the end and forget the decision the the great appreciation of the principle of play that took the player into that position yeah yeah john i think you touched on that already and i think the more important uh, the most important at the moment is that understanding the why um you touched on that already um why is it so important that players know that john <laughs> you there yeah, I keep on muting so I don't in- interrupt. Okay. I've got one boy in the gym. I've got one boy doing his own work. I've got one boy <laughs> in conversation there with his mum. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I mean, and, unless you understand the why, the purpose, then it's really difficult to sort of join all the dots, really. Uh, the why needs to be at the heart of everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's often the question that I would ask and would want to be asked as a coach. So what is the purpose? It's another question for why why are you doing this? You know, what's uh, you know, people have got to really understand um yeah, just what is the purpose of things. It's a it's a good one for you to ask yourself as a coach, what's the purpose of this exercise? What's the purpose of this game? What's the purpose of playing this playing this fixture? What's the purpose of having this person on the bench? What's the purpose of putting that player on in that position? So really understand the why is everything else falls out from, from that. Okay, good. You wanted to talk about one word on the slide that really puts your interest in. So can you share that? Yeah, so the one that I would, I think the rest of well, it, yeah, reasonably straightforward, but it's just around questioning. And, and again, it's something that I'm working really hard on. It's just try not ask questions where players just tell you the answer. How can I go through a whole session where I don't ask any questions where people tell me the answer? Uh, however, they have to show me stuff. So I have to see, I have to guess. Um, so things such as, so basically because they're going to have to show you anyway. So if I ask a player or a team a question and they tell me the answer, that's not learning. That's just them understanding probably what's inside my head or you know, they have an understanding from a cognitive level. So they kind of understand what they want to do, but they don't yet understand how to do it. So I just think we need to cut out asking. I think we're asking too many questions. I think we're asking questions for asking questions' sake, to be honest. Often we already know the answer. Um, so I, I, I like doing things like, guys, I, I want you to have a conversation. I want you to show me some whatever you're talking about, and I'm going to guess what you were talking about based upon what I see. So I'll, and, and then I'll just tell them the stuff I'm seeing. And I just think we're getting to it a lot faster. It's quite sticky. It's quite messy. It's it's different for the coach, but I do think we're getting some things. I was over in uh, where was it? I was in Dubai and I, I used the approach for the whole of the training session. Just right, guys. I want you to show me this. I want to see this. I've heard you talking about that. I'm going to guess what you were saying, and it was really sticky. Uh, some players were struggling with it quite a lot, but I do think in a relatively short period of time we actually got to some stuff. And not only were they talking about it, they were able to do some stuff that they weren't able to do at the start. So just think about, yeah, just think about show me, can I see, I want to see that. I've heard you guys talk about it, I want to see it. Um, things like I'm hearing it, I'm not seeing it, that, that type of language. Okay. I like the phrase, John, uh, uh, the, the eye-moving question. Uh, we can all ask a question and get a, a straight response. You know when you've asked a really good question, when somebody's eyes moving questions, that they're the ones we should be asking. Okay, good. Um, 
from here on we go to feedback reflection and next time guys if there are questions just ask eh? no problem at all yep are we all good to go we're good to go okay so yeah so yeah i, I think yeah it's it, it, it it's just we spoke quite quite a lot about feedback feedback so is the person is the player skillful around process and feedback themselves um I mean, my 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 benefit would be around. I, I would. I think we need to be theming stuff. So we need to have some themes around our season or our or a, or our or our, or our next month. So we were quite playful around having some themes, and then we would have some outcome stuff that the players were working towards. So the picture on the left was our best defending. It's called the Duke. Uh, the number 35 would be our most skillful player in the training session or a game voted by the players, both sides of the ball. So not just attack and defence. 35 is a combination of 2, 8, 10, 15. So taking some positionals, add them to, together, and you come up with a skillful player. Um, that's actually a picture of my eldest boy doing some cricket stuff. So feedback in the moment using some video stuff. Uh, the Generation Z, the, the the young people are very um, are very interested in around video, so words, letters, information, writing. They're not that excited about the pictures. Obviously, worth a thousand words. So there's a bit of everything going on. It's peer to peer because Oliver's not that much older than the guy Batten, and he's using some technology around feedback around the sport. Um, we would score the game differently. I don't ever ever score any game that I'm coach of or that my kids are involved in just the way that the sport scores it. I mean, the referee keeps the score anyway. So I would just be scoring it in a different way because it gives the best feedback um, and it sort of links it in. I think you get I think you get much faster pro progression as a team. So think about how you're scoring stuff. Um, the one on the right-hand side, oh, I've lost it. But the one on the right-hand side is around how feedback works. So this is from um, this is from Dan Hughes. I know he, he was a naughty boy when he wrote the Barcelona, the Barcelona way. But this is some real good information around feedback. So the reason that these types of speed cameras work and people affect their behaviour is because of this kind of this framework. So you get evidence. Um, it's relevant. So it's actually yeah, this is relevant to me. You're, you're, aware, you're mindful of the consequences. Uh, you're more likely to kill somebody if you hit them, or you're more likely to get, you know, well, what? There's a number of consequences, and then it affects your behavior. So that's actually how feedback works. Far too often, our feedback doesn't go in this loop. We don't produce evidence that would be um, helpful to, to that player. And lots of players, I would want my evidence in a different way to uh, Scotty. I, um, it's not always re relevant. Um, yeah, so yeah, so that's a good that's a good sort of framework to use around feedback. Um, but feedback's key. Getting people to reflect on stuff. Um, I, I can't bring it to life with a picture, but what we also need to do is stop closing down sessions in games. So often when people have a training session, they close it down in such a way that. We're not encouraging people to think about it until the next time. So we'll say things like, right, guys, well done. That's really good. I'll see you next week. I think we need to keep the session open. So be mindful of what we say. Can we set some little challenges, little tasks? Can we get people a bit more engaged before the next time that, that we meet? Um, probably a little bit around our session design as well. So too often, I'm going to use my hands. Too often we finish sort of up here, we've started here, we've, we've made some progression. So we get, get to this line here and then we start our next session and we're kind of down here again. And then we kind of get to the same level. We just keep getting the same level. Can we start our sessions where we finish? So if we start here and we finish here, can we start the next one here so we can finish there? It's just a steeper trajectory around learning. Okay. It goes back around our... It's a basic principle around us. We, we don't often start our sessions in a place where we finish the last one. And it's too easy. It's not that helpful. Um, and our learning tends to go like this. So we go up a bit and down a bit, up a little bit, 
And it's really zigzaggy. I think we need to keep it a little bit, not linear, of course it's not, but we need to keep it on a steeper curve. Um, and I think we can do that a lot better. Very rarely do I see a start of a training session where I think this is helpful. This is actually, this is, this is kicking on from the game or it's kicking on from the last training session I watched. Often the first 80% of the training session is, is just not that helpful. Okay. It's only the last 20% is any good, really. In fact, if you were if you were wise as a player, you'd only come for the last 20 minutes of the session. Okay, maybe uh, a question from Bertrand Belli. Um, Nick, you can also answer this one. How do you analyze the culture that Eddie Jones has implemented in the England team for the past few years, if we're talking about culture? Um, I think Eddie's done, um, uh, how would I describe his culture? It's really challenging. So the players would come in and say they are challenged. Um, now, you might say, well, of course they should be challenged, but lots of them are not challenged back in their clubs. They don't find it a challenging environment in terms of the type of training. Um, I think he periodizes his week. So the beginning of the week would be a lot more around exploration and trying stuff. It's still be challenging, physically challenging. There's a lot demanded of them. Um, high expectations. Um, he supports them really well if they continue to reach the high expectations. If they would drop below what he thinks was right, they would not know about it. And then as you get closer to the game, the, it, it would change. Um, there'd be less tolerance around stuff not going well, less tolerance around people not knowing stuff. Um, so in my view, is how he periodizes a week lends itself to performing well. The players are ready to go. Um, they've dotted I's, crossed T's. They've done stuff. They've tried stuff. Um, and they're ready to go. And th that would be proven. Often England start well. Um, I think it prepares them really well. So it would be, his culture would be really, really, really challenging. Um, how else would, would, would I describe it? It would be another word. It'd probably be... Um, I'm trying to think of another word. Scotty, help me out because you, you've seen him coach as well. Um, uh, there's, there's, two, go on. Uh, there's a couple of key things that really stand out for me. Um, his, I think you touched on it before, his observation skills uh, are outstanding. Not what he notices, but he notices what's important. Um, he's got a, a fantastic um, ability to notice what's important. Uh, Then we could talk about session, you know, session design and practice design and all that sort of stuff. But what he is really good at is challenging players. Then having identified what's important, challenging them under pressure and under intensity, uh, they have to operate and work at a in their sessions at an intensity greater than match intensity. Um, particularly, as you say, you know, periodization during the week, but they work at a, a at a at a level greater than match intensity and therefore they have a better chance of um, um, repeating that intensity when the game comes on. So it's the things that are important and then the things that are important um, are practiced under intense circumstances. Okay. Um, uh, so there was just one thing, I would give clarity. They turn up to the match and they've got clarity. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So they know what to do, what to expect, and where they want to go, and how it will end yeah, if they do it. Yeah, well, some scenarios, some situations. This is the plan. Um, I still think, and, I, and if he's listening to this, fine, because I would. I think I have told him he was facing. I'll tell him again. I still think they can do tactical better. I think where they've been caught out back in the end, three or four games where the opposition have, have shifted, they've changed, and England have been slow to change. Now they've. Um, I, and I do know in the final for a fact they, they did recognise it would be fairly straightforward against the South Africans. They just were not able to do it. So on that day, in that situation, they recognised what they needed to do. They were just un unable to do it. I still think we can do tactical better. But it would be my challenge to all coaches um, is how are we coaching tactical? Maybe that can be the, the subject of the next one, Christoph. Yeah, tactical it would be good. Coaching. I think that's an important one uh, that we can touch. Um, I have one question, which is actually a good question from Selig. When a game is on Saturday and the next session is on a Wednesday, it's difficult to have a carryover from the feedback 
the, the next uh, in the session. Any tips on how to refocus the players on the feedback they got from the game? Yeah, look, you could do stuff electronically, WhatsApp, uh, use Coach Logic, um, you know, or, or platforms such as that. So you can actually, but where people are having conversations, I think it'd be really useful that they turn up to training and there's been a number of conversations or there's been some stuff that people have shared. Um, and clearly, electronically, you can look to do some of that. You could give players some responsibility. So actually just split. So rather than just have one captain, have a number of people who are responsible for parts of the game. You just check in with them. It's actually the player's responsibility to sort it out. Um, you know, so you might have somebody who's responsible around, um, you know, the common ones would be defence. It might be counter-attack. There might be a number of people who have some responsibility. But with the aim of basically that you process some stuff that's gone well and understand why. So why why did this go well? Let's understand that. And what didn't go well, how can it be better next time? Um, I think if you wait until your next training session, you're kind of always, you're probably, if we stay, we finish there. The game's here, and it's like, then we're, we're probably all, we're going to start down here. It's about starting closest to the how the game ended. I think, of, of, yeah, just think about that. Just think about, you know, the stuff that you can use electronically. Coach logic, and I know there's others, but that's what we use, and I think it's class because if you use video content, if you're not using video content, then you need to think about it because that's how your players learn. So your players your players go on to YouTube something like 200 odd times a day. Um, YouTube and other platforms are is how they learn stuff. So actually, this generation is going to find it no, no problems whatsoever and not going to school, quite frankly. It might actually change education. Um, so my kids are highly motivated by learning because it's just normal. They just go on their computers and learn stuff anyway. Um, so that's how I would be thinking about it. Understand and having an understanding rate, understand of this generation would be would be useful. Okay. You can share some stuff with you, Christoph. I'm, I'm, I don't know if you've got a document on Generation Z, but I've got something I can share with you. You can send out to people. Okay, it would be good. So I will uh, definitely will do that. And we have one more question before we go to Scotty. Um, do you have any tips to increase the level of involvement with players? Yeah, just give them choice. Give them empowerment. Um, that's what I would do if if players are not that engaged, you might need to own that feedback a little bit as the coach. Maybe you're doing too much. Um, and it is and it is a tendency as a coach because often we're very nurturing and we want to help and we want to support. But again, it comes back to maybe you're just getting in the way a little bit. Could you lie? Something we tried is that we had player coaches. So we give four or five players every week an opportunity to be part of the coaching team. So they would meet a little bit earlier for the session. They'd be involved in the planning of the session involved in the review of the session um <coughs> so yeah so that's the stuff that we would do okay good um now we talked already a lot about culture so we already touched the thing some things that uh with nick in his presentation so nick we are going to now look at what you actually have done in colorno and where you want to go um, for you, it was a big change coming from the RFU to, to Italy in a different culture. So, yeah, let's uh, see how that went or is going. And uh, so, up to you, Nick. Okay, so what I thought I'd do is, is talk a little bit from the point of view of somebody who's leading the program. Um, and this is probably more relevant to, to head coaches or directors of rugby than um, uh, than actual looking at what happens in a coaching session. But we'll, when we get towards the end, uh, we will talk a little bit about that, the how, how we actually do it. So I'm going to introduce um, the club. Um, as you say, when I arrived, it was a big change in culture. So it took a while for me to understand my role. So I'll just talk about how I see my role now. Um, we've got a little bit around cultural diversity what that looks like and then I'm going to talk um, about the performance squad that we have and uh, how we actually um, uh, use a couple of models to direct the program to uh, to send the program make sure everybody is pointing in the same direction <clears throat> so yeah as no stay on the first one stay on the first one um, so as Fletch said just keep banging in questions uh, as, as you wish 
Um, Rugby Colorno for me was a huge uh, shock. Uh, it's an absolutely unique uh, rugby club. Not unique in Italy, but it's unique uh, from any club that I'd seen before. Um, we got a fully professional top 12 club, uh, a top 12 team and program um, with international players, um, uh, players from all over. We've got a women's team as well, um, which uh, is uh, full of international players. Uh, the Italian national side do really well in the Six Nations. And we've been, our club, along with a couple of others, have been the um, uh, the bedrock of, of a, that international success in the last two or three years. When I took over, we were the champions of Italy, um, our female squad. Um, we've got an under-18s and under-16s squad who play in. In Italy, they have an elite championship. Both uh, of those squads are in the elite championship. But all of this is comes from a club of, that's based in a town of only 12,000 people. Not too far from Parma, which has a couple of hundred thousand people. It's a city, but um, it's just 12,000 people there supporting rugby excellence, really. Um, we've got then everything from under eights through to under 14s, um, what I call the rugby development um, um, group. Uh, it, it's incredible. Um, you've got we've got ten minibuses and guys, volunteers from the club, go out and pick the kids up in the afternoon. And every afternoon, there's there's lots of rugby activity going on from half past three in the afternoon. Um, we have uh, the Buffalo, uh, who is a team for adults with learning difficulties. Again, the buses go around and pick the guys up, um, and uh bring them to the rugby club two or three times a week they're coached by the senior players um as well as a a, a cadet a, a, a second team and we just introduced diddy rugby which is rugby for um preschool age um so it it, it genuinely does have uh a reach into the whole of the community for me to arrive there and realize that i was director of rugby um well, the whole lot was uh, daunting, challenging. How do you add value um, to uh, what's already happening, which I, I think is, is world class, absolutely world class in a, in a small town. Um, if we just move on to the next slide, Christoph, and this is a slide I've used in the past um, about the director of rugby role, could be the head coach role, um, and it splits the role into three hopefully equal areas leadership management and coaching um the leadership stuff i was lucky uh, and i'm not i don't think they're listening so um i'm not uh flattering the board here they were a, a very forward thinking group of people when i arrived uh their vision was to make colorno um a point of reference in Italian rugby. I think it already was, um, but they wanted it to be seen as a point of reference. That was um, a little bit uh, difficult to actually quantify for every mo mo um, or to recognise for every member of the club. So I worked with a guy called Dave Lind, who's a Munsterman, but he's been in Italy for over 20 years. And we worked with the board and the, the, the vision now for the club is that we want um, Rugby Colorno to be the best rugby club in Italy to play for, to work at and to visit. That actually means something to every coach. It means something to everybody in the clubhouse. Um, it means something to everybody who's in a management role at the club. Um, it means something slightly different. The best rugby club in Italy to play for means something different to an under eight what it does to a fully professional top 12 player but it still means something um, and it's something that we can work with each coach on um, on delivering so um, question there Nick yeah so yeah. you talked about your vision as a club your vision as insights as a club or a team how important was it for you to create a vision for the whole club to see what direction you were going and the buy-in everyone had well, what we try to do with, with that vision, the best rugby club in Italy to play for, was create something that worked 
as I say, for uh, an elite women's team, um, for a top 12 club, but also for the, um, the under eights. The way we did that was in my first month there, I met um, with every member of the club, parents, players, everybody, and we talked about what was important to them, their values, um, and they all helped put together with, with Dave's f- facilitation. That's how this, this vision came. It's not my vision. It, it genuinely is a club vision. When you have diversity, cultural diversity, um, when you have a rugby team, when you have a group of people together, you all need to believe in the same thing. And uh, I'm hopeful that that everybody in the club, A, un, um, knows what the vision is, but B, understands what it means to them. Okay. And how they, and how they can contribute to it. Good. Okay. Next slide or... So no, no, stay on here. So leading a program, the management bit is the boring stuff, the bit I'm I don't enjoy. But um, we can have a vision. That's what we're going to deliver. We have to have processes in there. Each coach has to understand how they can help deliver that vision, um, what their day to day organisation looks like, what their um, <clears throat> who they who they consult, who they what their where their support is. Um, putting in, I'm not a big fan of meetings, but making sure we communicate to everybody in the club what we're doing. So that it, that is meetings, talking to each other. That's communication. So 30% of my time spent in leadership, 30% of my time is spent in management, and 30% of my time is spent in coaching, which is uh, just helping people be able to deliver. It. There will be there will be areas where they need more support. There will be um, strengths to maximise and there will be uh, limitations, weaknesses to manage. But as a team, as a club, um, that's coaching. So it's not necessarily coaching on the field. Some of it is, some of it isn't. It's, but it's coaching the people to, do, to be able to deliver that vision. Um, so, yeah, that, that kind of is where we was. I was a little bit, I took a lot of advice from people and I was probably a little bit um, lazy when I arrived there. Everybody said, oh, when you go over to Italy, it's a, a, a particular sort of culture. There will be this, they will be that, they'll be emotional, there'll be lots and lots of things. Um, when I looked at the, the squad we actually have, and I talked earlier about... Um, uh, all the different nationalities, all the different cultures that we have in there, treating a group of people just as a homogenous group doesn't make any sense for me. Um, we had to focus on what it was that actually united us. Um, even within Italy, as I say, the, the flag on the bottom left is uh, Sicilia, Sicily. Uh, the one in the centre with the cross is Sardinia. Very, very different people. We had to find something. Um, we had to work out what United is, um, and that uh, took it took a while for the penny to, penny to drop. I was looking to um, I was looking for what the Italian culture was, rather than helping define what our culture was and who we were. Um, so it was a little bit of naivety on my part there. Okay. Mm, yep. So just moving a little bit to the the how I've designed the program and uh, with Fletch, we worked on this with the age uh, grade sides in, in England, this uh, this model um, probably five or six years ago. <clears throat> um, the one we used there said that the game was at the center. Um, if I'm working with our um, senior women's team or senior men's team, I'm going to focus on the, the performance side here. Working with the, the performance teams, we have to have the playing philosophy in the middle, the game. This is the game, our perfect game. If you um, uh, Just before you go to sleep at night, you close your eyes. When I was a younger man, I used to think of different things, but now I think of rugby. Um, and I think of my ideal game of rugby. Uh, what that looks like is my forms my, my playing philosophy, if you like. Um, it's about 
continuity, decision making, movement, uh, the pleasure of movement, as Veal Pro would, would say. I appreciate some of the guys would think it would be the perfect scrum or something like that. It would be very different. But we all have a, a playing philosophy, how we see the game should be. We, we want the game to be played. That has to be central. Uh, what I've found in most rugby environments I've been into is that is not particularly well articulated or understood, even within a group of coaches. It's not particularly well uh, communicated or understood. And then working around the coaches in the centre, you have a group of experts around these areas. So you've got actions, which is skills required, um, behaviours, fitness and preparation um for me um gr there are some great experts working in those areas and when i moved to Kelowna, there were some good experts working in those areas but like in most places each one of those was not particularly well connected to delivering what the playing philosophy required so quite simply, fitness, <clears throat> if we have a certain way of playing the game, then everything our strength and conditioning team does, everything that they, uh, the, um, all of their gym programs, all of their, uh, uh, all of their programs should be, uh, have the outcome of delivering better, better athletes who are capable of playing the game we want to play. We don't want guys who look good in the gym. We don't want something necessarily that's fantastic scientifically, but produces an athlete, athlete who is not what we, the kind of athlete that we need uh, to play the game we want to play. Because that's the game um, that we see suits our players, suits the, 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 the way we play. Okay. Good. And uh, what do behaviors? Um, oh, sorry. I have a question here from Bertrand Belli. So, what's your playing philosophy? Do you use um, initials too, like E nine for everybody at nine and stuff like that? Um, my playing philosophy is is even simpler than that. Um, my playing philosophy is is based on the principles of play. Um, it's uh, the go forward bit uh, is around um, not playing the game north south. Yeah. Not always north south, but we need to go forward. We play the game north south. For me, there's only a couple of decisions. To, well, there's three or four ways of going forward. Um, you run forward, you can kick the ball forward, uh, or you can pass to somebody else who can take the ball forward. Quite simple. We just go forward. Um, continuity. Uh, again, my philosophy is it's really simple. We work on the decision making. We either um, support the ball carrier or we support the space. That's really simple. We and we stick by those those principles of play have been true since 1823 or whenever it was. Um, that's the game. Um, we we play the game north south. We keep the ball in play. Um, I'm from uh, Nottingham. We had a great soccer coach called Brian Clough many, many years ago who said his playing philosophy was play uh, football with the ball on the floor because uh, if God had wanted the game to be played in the air, he'd have put goals up in the air. Um, again, with rugby, if we're meant to be kicking the ball off the pitch, um, well, then we'd, we'd score points for kicking off the pitch. We don't keep the ball in play. Is another part of my uh, is another part of my playing philosophy. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so everything has to come back into that playing philosophy. I'm talking there about it as a director of rugby, about it being my play, playing philosophy. Um, I'm accountable for that, um, but. The coaches have to be responsible as well, and it cannot just be my my playing philosophy. We have to have a a not a compromise, but a consensus as to what that playing philosophy looks like. 
<clears throat> it's a little bit dependent on the players we've got as well. Um, so if you want to see that into um, what that really looks like, and we can we can talk about this with um, you know, and, and welcome other people's observations. I talk there about continuity um, being part of my playing philosophy. A limiting factor uh, around that <clears throat> I found in Colorno, and I've, it's an observation generally in Italian rugby, <clears throat> is the speed back into the game, uh, getting back into the game to be in a good position, getting back in, a, in, in the, into the game to, to contribute, getting back in the game to uh, make a, have an effect. Um, Italians, I'm going to talk about the culture thing here, they love culture. Uh, they love coffee. They love to do something and reflect on it and chat about it and talk about it. And a little bit that is reflected in the way the game is played sometimes. They'll put in a fantastic tackle and lie on the floor for several seconds, have their coffee and think about what a great job they've just done rather than thinking about what the next job was. So to deliver our playing philosophy um, around continuity, we needed to work on back in the game. So in terms of actions, um, going around there, everything has, that's my challenge to all of our coaching team and our support staff. That is where we're looking to improve. In terms of actions, what does that mean to our skills coaching? In terms of behaviours, what does that mean mean to our uh, 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 Roberto, who, who looks after our um, uh, psychological skills programme? What does that mean to our um, guys who uh, do our s and uh, um, And again, around preparation. Is our preparation, when I talk about preparation, I talk about diet, I talk about all the stuff that happens off, off the pitch that is not necessarily um, uh, the strength and conditioning stuff, but it's all of the personal preparation around it. My challenge to those guys is, okay, you've got great programs. How are they contributing to what we need, which is our players to get back into the game quicker? Okay, uh, good. I have, I'm going to have to close down because we're busy already. So I have three last questions coming in. So the first one may be for John and then we get back into the culture. John, you're there or still muted? <laughs> He's muted. Ah, muted. Okay, good. So we'll go for the first one for Nick. Um, no, oh, you're back. I'm back. Okay, I'm back. So, so Nick was talking about uh, the behaviors. Yeah, so let's say behaviors. How important is changing the behaviors in part of your playing philosophy or inside like back in the game? So changing behaviors for your team to get the buy-in and, and, and get to them to play the philosophy. Yeah, I mean, first of the behaviors, I like the language. Lots of environments would use values. I think values is, it's definitely, it's another, it's another level deeper. My, my, my preference would be use behaviors. The reason we went to behaviors is because you can see behaviors. Sometimes you can't see people's values. Uh, they don't necessarily manifest themselves. Uh, behaviors is really important. Um, I think for a club to have a set of behaviors is useful. It's useful to have some conversations. So most clubs will talk about behaviors. They might have something, um, you know, that they're involved with, but far too often we don't talk about it. We don't reference it. Um, so having having some behaviors within your environment is important, but it's only important if you continue to check in about them and talk about them. So the RFU have some, although they call them values, teamwork, respect, enjoyment, discipline, self-organizing, a set of values, so the treads. And I think it's important that people continue to talk about them. Okay. Um, Good. Um, so I have three more questions. One is from Cedric Anzo. So, Scotty, uh, do you scout players to suit the philosophy or do you change the philosophy around the players you have? Um, there's management. Um, there, are, there are a couple of things that you have. You have your philosophy, um, your perfect world. Then you have another circle, which is the group of people that you've got. 
and uh, coaching is bringing the two of those closer together. Um, you probably never reach where you need to be necessarily um, for various different reasons. And remember, we're talking a you know pretty big squad here. They're not all all going to be uh, in the same place at the same time. But the skill of coaching is 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 bringing that vision and that reality closer together. Um, I have a yeah you know. I know how I like the game to be played, and I think everybody has that um, that inner um, view of what the perfect get, or they should. Every coach should have that inner view of what perfect game looks like. Okay, good. Uh, then the second question from Tony Timms: How do you see your ideas working with teams that only train twice a week and play once? How do I feel that what, sorry? So, I, I how do you see your ideas around the playing philosophy and everything around it with teams that only train twice a week and play once a week? So, um, I, I think um, teams, you have to recognize that uh, teams that train twice and play once, the players have other things going on in their lives. Everybody has other things going, their lives, uh, going on in their life. But it's not necessarily rugby is not necessarily their job. Um, the skill of the coach there is about uh, being even sharper. In your, you should be sharp anyway, but even sharper in your communication skills, even sharper in your ability to articulate in fewer words or preferably in in pictures and videos sent um, during the week. Exactly. Um, what what need, what they should be thinking about, um, prompting them. Okay, good. Okay. I have a few more. The questions are coming in. Good. Um, maybe some for the time now. So maybe this is a good one for you both. Um, with the quarantine, how do you motivate your team if they know the next game is only at six months away from now? So... Um. Go on, Scotty. You can have a go, mate, because that's live. It's a live thing for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it really, really is applicable. Um, it's an unprecedented situation. Uh, we just don't know uh, how people are going to be affected. Um, I think at this point in time, we ha we haven't, as a club, really got into this yet. Uh, everybody in Colorno, sadly, it's a, a small town. Um, we've had. A number of deaths. Um, everybody will know somebody who's passed away. We we've got to um, be really mindful as to how we deal with the trauma that and the the, the grief that people will be feeling. Um, that's the first step. Beyond there, there will come a time when people are ready to think about rugby again. Um, but I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to predict exactly when that's going to be. And uh, maybe a question from, from Bertrand wanted to know, so how do you keep your guys focused on that and still being ready for the next season? So it's only six months away. So how do you keep them still focused on their job? So we've, um, we've been, um, we've asked them to, we've, they've got off online coaching diaries. Um, we're asking them to keep uh, a record. Some of them are in some pretty difficult uh, situations. They're in an apartment without a garden. Uh, the police are patrolling the streets, so they have to be really careful. Um, they're not allowed to train outdoors now. That, that's forbidden. Um, so we're asking them to uh, keep video diaries of their training, also diaries of their training, keeping that varied, um, what they're doing in their apartment, uh, whatever they can actually manage within their apartments. Um, and we're just... You know, the, we don't want the guys to go stir crazy. We're just keeping talking to them, keeping um, keeping them focused, keeping talking rugby, um, just keeping talking to each other more than anything. Okay, good. And then we go for a last question. It's uh, of our friend and your friend Jerry Roberts. So uh, oh, he's following. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Good. <laughs> so, um, do your players have any input on the playing philosophy of the team or not? Uh, for me, yeah, and then uh, and John also after, so it's fine. Yep. Um, from from me, the playing philosophy was uh, it, it's a professional squad. Um, we have a playing philosophy, and we 
uh, over the summer, we got promoted to the top uh, Dota G, the top 12. We, we tried to recruit players. We interviewed every player that we signed, and we tried to recruit players who we felt fitted in with our philosophy rather than having a group of, of people and then trying to draw a philosophy, philosophy from them. Um, remember, we've got a, a, an ongoing club here that needs to represent and reflect the community around it and the people around it. Um, so, yeah, we, we it is a bit of a blend. They, we, we do have leadership groups who help shape things, um, but the broad philosophy is driven by the club. Okay, and John, looking at your part, how is it for you? Like, like saying you have a club that only coaches twice, as, as training twice a week and stuff. What will you think about um, getting involvement in the players for the playing philosophy? Because you can't buy players for more than an amateur game. Yeah, I mean the players have to be involved uh, right from the start. Really, they need to be involved in it. I, I think you'd probably support them around the framework around principles of play. From an RF, an English rugby point of view, we have the card skills. I think they really, uh, they give good support to environments. So we've adopted them um, in my cricket club. We've adopted them in the rugby club. They make a lot of sense. Sort of creativity, awareness, resilience, decision making, self organising. So uh, and then we we just got that playing group. So what's the stuff that they that that they want to focus on? So the last playing group, from an England point of view, a couple of things in attack. So they wanted to be. The most skillful low numbers in the world. So, so our forwards, uh, our, our low numbers wanted to have lots of skillful moments. So we looked to measure that. Uh, we'd 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 want to keep the ball moving more than anybody else. So our skills around the contact, our lifting off the floor. Um, lots of players need to play scrum half because the scrum half the game's too fast for us. We're scrum off to be there all the time. From a defence point of view, we had some stuff like. Don't let the opposition pass the ball more than twice. So the players would come up with that, but it would be the framework would always be there, similar to Scotty, principles of play and the card skills. Um, and then we just go from there, really. But uh, we used to give them a book at the start of the season and tell them that this was their, uh, this is the player book. They would open it up and it would obviously be empty. And we'd say, right, let's just, you know, let's just, let's just go with this group and see, you know, what's the stuff that. What's the stuff that you want to be? Okay. You know, the stuff that you want to be good at. Good. Okay, guys. Um, we are going to close down this session. We're already busy for almost two hours. Brilliant. Um, maybe, maybe something. Okay. Let's say, Nick, if there's one sentence you can say uh, at the end for the coaches who have followed, what would it be? Some tip? Oh, wow. I wish you'd give me a, <laughs> a, a, a operation on that. Um, from from my point of view, make sure it, it, it it's really important to articulate uh, where your true north is, what your direction is, and make sure everybody understands it. Okay, good, John. Yeah, uh, stay safe. That's the most important thing. So, <laughs> and then the second one would be around choice. Okay, choice. So just, just give people choice. Give give people opportunities to to. You know, to find the north. Okay, very good. So I would like to first thank Nick and Fletch to be here and to give us this brilliant session. It was very entertaining, very learnful. Thank you for that, boys. Cheers, guys. Thanks for the opportunity, Chris. I've well organized. Yep. Well done, Chris. Not not enough jokes. We should, we it's should have the asked. second best webinar I've been on today. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, good. The first one was this afternoon with me or uh, no? <laughs> yeah, no, the first one was your summer else. Now okay. I'm already teasing, mate. Well done. Okay. Awesome. I, think, I think you organizing this stuff is just great. And look, anywhere that me and Scotty can help, just get and touch anybody at any time. Um, Christoph, if you want to chuck our details out when, you know, when there's, when the times are different, get yourself over to Cologne. Or ten. It's, a, it's an awesome club. Scotty's doing a fantastic job. Um, uh, I've, I've definitely shared lots of what I learned from Scotty and Colono with the clubs that I'm involved with here. It's a, yeah. it's a fantastic environment to go into. And if you feel as though that Magic Academy can help you, then ask. 
Yeah, for me the same. If you have the chance to pass by Cologne or go by the club, it's a brilliant club. And uh, also the food and the wine is brilliant. Uh, and uh, if you have a chance, go and look on the website of, of the Magic Academy. John is doing great stuff with that on beating the game and, and all the rest in Game Sense training. So have a look on that. Uh, it's always brilliant. For the rest, I would like to invite you guys tomorrow evening again for our session planning. And on Thursday, we'll talk about defense with Bluish. Okay, good. Everyone, have a nice night. See you later. Ciao. Ciao.